This is the Linear Algebra Lectures video series. You can find more information about this video as well as a link to the written textbook in the description below. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more about this video series and the associated teaching and learning tools I've created for it. Lecture 19, The Matrix of a Linear Transformation. Our objectives for this lecture are to find the standard matrix of a linear transformation and use information about a linear transformation to compute columns of its standard matrix. We're going to start by talking about something called standard basis vectors. So the standard basis vector E sub j has a 1 in the jth entry and zeros everywhere else. So in R2, we have two of these standard vectors. We've got E1 and E2. E1 is the vector 1, 0, and E2 is the vector 0, 1. In R3, there are three standard vectors, E1, E2, and E3 that you can see here. And so in Rn, there are n standard basis vectors, E1 through En. Now this notation is a little bit ambiguous, because if I just say E2, I could be referring to the vector 0, 1, 0 in R3, but I could also be referring to the vector 0, 1, 0, 0 in R4, or infinitely many other vectors. So we're going to have to use context to understand what the E notation means. Now standard basis vectors are useful because if we know the values of t of e1, t of e2, and so on for a linear transformation, then we're going to be able to compute the value of t for any other vector. Let's see how that works with an example. So let's suppose that t is a linear transformation and that we are given that t of e1 is the vector negative 3, 0, 5, and t of e2 is the vector negative 1, negative 2, 6, and we're asked to compute t of the vector 2, negative 3. Notice that this is different from the linear transformations that we've studied earlier in this course, because we're not given an explicit formula for t. Instead, we're just given these two pieces of information and told to somehow put them together to figure out t of a different vector. Well, the trick here is to realize that we can take the vector 2, negative 3 and break it up in terms of e1 and e2. We know what t of e1 and t of e2 are, so we need to somehow introduce e1 and e2 into this problem. So we rewrite the vector 2, negative 3 as 2e1 plus negative 3e2. So then that means that t of the vector 2, negative 3 is t of 2e1 plus negative 3e2. But as we've seen in our study of linear transformations, t interacts nicely with that linear combination, and so that works out to be 2t of e1 plus negative 3t of e2. And since we know what t of e1 and t of e2 are, we can substitute and then finally compute our result of negative 3, 6, negative 8. Now, if we're given a matrix transformation, t of x equals ax, we can find the value of t at the standard basis vectors pretty easily. t of ej is a times ej, and when you multiply a times one of those standard basis vectors, a times ej works out to be the jth column of a. Let's see this in action. So let's suppose that we have this transformation, t of x equals ax, where a is the matrix that we see here, and we want to compute t of e2. Well, first we need to understand which e2 are we talking about? How many entries does this vector e2 have? Well, the matrix has four columns and three rows, which means that t is a transformation whose domain is r4 and whose codomain is r3. Since we're plugging e2 into this transformation, the e2 that we're talking about has to be a vector in the domain of t, which means that this e2 has to be the e2 in R4, namely the vector 0, 1, 0, 0. And when we plug in t of e2, that's the same as multiplying a times e2. When we work that out, we get the vector negative 1, 4, 3, which as we said earlier is in fact just the second column of a. Now we mentioned at the end of the previous lecture that in fact every linear transformation is a matrix transformation. So here's where we're going to see the proof of why that's true. What the theorem says is that if t is a linear transformation, then t is a matrix transformation, t of x equals ax, and what's the matrix A that makes that work? Well it turns out that it's the matrix whose columns are the vectors t of e1, t of e2, t of e3, and so on. Alright, let's try to understand why this is true. So we need to prove that t of x equals ax for any vector x, where a is that matrix whose columns are t of ej. So let's let x be any vector, and we'll write out x in terms of its entries, so that x is the vector x1, x2, up through xn. And let's let a be that matrix whose columns are t of ej. And as we did in example 1, we can decompose the vector x in terms of the e's. So we can write x as x1 times e1, plus x2 times e2, and so on. This is exactly what we were doing back in example 1. So now what's t of x? 
Well, t is a linear transformation, which means that t interacts nicely with that linear combination, which means we can expand it out and write it as x1 t of e1 plus x2 t of e2 and so on. That's using the fact that t is linear. But now what happens when we multiply a by x? We'd like to say that t of x and ax are the same thing, so we figured out what t of x is, what's ax? Well, when we multiply a matrix times a vector, what that means, when we initially defined that, what that actually means is a linear combination of the columns of the matrix, where the weights in the linear combination are the entries in the vector. So in this case, that works out to be x1 t of e1 plus x2 t of e2 and so on. And notice that we got the same thing. When we computed t of x and when we computed a times x, we got the same expression, which means that t of x equals a times x no matter what x is. So that proves that t, which we were given was a linear transformation, is in fact a matrix transformation. Now this matrix, whose columns are t of e1, t of e2, and so on, we call that the standard matrix of t, the standard matrix of the transformation t. Let's look at this example. So let's suppose that we want to define a transformation that represents a 60 degree counterclockwise rotation about the origin. So we want to take every vector and rotate it 60 degrees counterclockwise, and we want to try to understand the standard matrix of that linear transformation. Well, what we've just seen, the theorem that we just saw, tells us that all we need to know is what t of e1 and t of e2 are, and those will be the columns of the matrix that we're looking for. Okay, so what's t of e1? Well, we can use a little bit of trigonometry, and we write the hypotenuse of that triangle is the vector t of e1. And because e1, that standard basis vector, is one unit long, then when we rotate it, it'll still be one unit long. So we've got a right triangle with a 60 degree angle. And if you remember a little bit of your trigonometry, that'll tell us that the x, the horizontal side of that triangle, is 1 half, and the y, the vertical side of that triangle, is square root of 3 over 2. So that means that t of e1 is the vector 1 half radical 3 over 2. For t of e2, we can see that we have a 60 degree angle formed between the y-axis and the rotated vector t of e2. So that means that we've got a right triangle with a 30 degree angle. And again, a little bit of trigonometry is going to tell us that the horizontal side of that triangle is radical 3 over 2, and the vertical side is 1 half. Now we're in quadrant 2, which means the x component of this t of e2 vector is negative. So our vector t of e2 is negative radical 3 over 2, 1 half. We see that our standard matrix is, reading from left to right, 1 half, negative radical 3 over 2, radical 3 over 2, 1 half. Let's try this out. Let's plot the vector negative 4, 2, multiply it by this matrix, and see where we get when we rotate this vector 60 degrees counterclockwise. So there's negative 4, 2. We multiply the matrix times that vector. We get the result negative 2 minus radical 3, 1 minus 2 radical 3, which approximately is negative 3.73, negative 2.46. And when we plot that, we see that that matches up visually with the idea of rotating this vector counterclockwise by 60 degrees. Let's do some more abstract examples. So let's suppose that we know that we have a linear transformation, and we happen to know that t of the vector 1, 0, negative 1 equals the 0 vector. And we want to try to understand why this would mean that the first and third columns of the standard matrix for t would have to be equal. Well, first let's remember what that theorem that we talked about before tells us. When I say the first column of the standard matrix for t, we need to understand that that just means t of e1. And when I say the third column of the standard matrix for t, that means t of e3. And so this question is asking us, why is t of e1 equal to t of e3? And what we know is that t of the vector 1, 0, negative 1 is equal to the 0 vector. So as we've done before, let's decompose that vector 1, 0, negative 1 in terms of the e's. And this turns out to be 1, e1, plus negative 1, e3. When we plug that linear combination into t, because we know that t is a linear transformation, it breaks apart. So that gives us t of e1 minus t of e3 equals 0. Add t of e3 to both sides, and that tells us that t of e1 equals t of e3, just like we wanted. Here's another example. Here we're told that t is a linear transformation, and t of the vector negative 2, negative 1, 2 is equal to negative 5, 2, and t of 1, 1, negative 1 is equal to 3, 7, and we're asked for the second column of the standard matrix for t. Now we see a hint here, and we'll talk about that in a second, but let's focus on what the question is asking us for. It's asking us for the second column of the standard matrix for t, and again, remembering that theorem from before, that means that we're being asked for t of e2. 
So how do we get t of e2 here? Well, we're given t of v1 and v2, where v1 and v2 are those two vectors that I've highlighted. And so the hint is telling us to solve the equation x1 v1 plus x2 v2 equals e2. And if you're not quite sure yet why that's going to help us out, just follow along and you'll see it here in a minute. When we solve that equation, we get the solution x1 equals 1, x2 equals 2. And that means that e2 is 1 v1 plus 2 v2. And so then t of e2 is t of 1 v1 plus 2 v2. And again, t is a linear transformation, which means that t is going to interact nicely with that linear combination. That's going to turn into 1 times t of v1 plus 2 times t of v2. And we were given t of v1 and t of v2 in the original problem. So we can substitute those values in, and then we can compute our final answer, which is the vector 1, 16. Thanks for watching this video lecture. You can find links to the other videos in this series and to the written textbook in the description below. If you're an instructor, you can contact me for more information about the over 300 online linear algebra homework problems that I've created for the free MyOpenMath platform.